next year's election will be the 12th that I have followed as a journalist or a pollster. And I've never known an election now 15 months out where I've been less certain as to what's likely to happen. Now, uh, it ought to be fairly obvious. Uh, our latest poll in this morning's Sun has Labour three points ahead. And it's our third poll this week and all three have had Labour two or three points ahead. So it seems to be settling down at a lower Labour lead than it has been for the last few months. And if one looks back at the history of Conservative governments and Labour oppositions, one would say it's easy. If Labour is only this far ahead with 15 months ago, we know that what always happens is Conservative governments recover ground as the election approaches, Labour oppositions lose ground. So this should look very good for the Conservatives. However, I'm not so sure that history is such a perfect guide because there are two factors which we've not had before. The first is we have the Liberal Democrats in government, not in opposition. So one of the dynamics of past parliaments is the Liberals or Liberal Democrats gaining protest vote and gaining ground with the extra publicity of the election campaign. They're in government question, will they recover any or much of the ground they've lost since last time? I suspect they will regain some, but I can't be sure. The second new factor is UKIP. Um, we've had right-wing parties before on the far right. You've had Oswald Mosley, the National Front, BNP, but they've always been toxic. They've not really mattered at general elections. The thing about UKIP is for the first time in modern British history, by modern I mean since 1832, <laughs> the first time we've got a non-toxic nationalist party to the right of the Conservatives. We have them currently at around 11, 12%. I think they'll win the, U the European elections this May. Um, they could win them by quite a margin. I wouldn't be that surprised if uh, twice as many people vote UKIP as vote Conservative uh, this coming May. After that, that's the big unknown. How will the Conservative Party react if they are defeated so heavily? Will they manage to brush it off and stay united and say this was a low turnout, second order election, it'll be very different when we move to a general election when people have to make a hard choice as to who's going to govern because the UKIP ain't going to govern. May have no MPs at the most one or two. If the Conservatives hold together, they may be able to see off the UKIP threat. If the Conservative Party descends into internal fighting later this summer, very different scenario. So I can't be sure who's going to be the largest party next year. I'm fairly sure, not certain, but fairly sure that neither Labour or Conservative is going to have an outright majority. And I'd be astonished if either has a, a working majority of 20 or 30 or more. Um, so there'll be probably a hung parliament, but a hung parliament covers a number of different uh, scenarios depending on the precise arithmetic as to whether you get a coalition or a minority uh, a government, what the relationship is between the um, larger party and the Liberal Democrats, and so on. So I want to suggest three lessons from this. The first lesson is it's going to be important to keep in touch with all three main parties. And if you're out, uh, operating in Scotland or Wales, the Scottish and Welsh Nationalists, we don't know who's going to be in government. Keep in touch with all three parties. And keep in touch with them, not just up to the election, but beyond. Because one of the interesting things about the current parliament is it's not just been about um, arguments within the coalition between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, but on a number of issues, especially where the Lib Dems and Conservatives are not quite a, as one, what Labour has wanted to do, what policies Labour has supported, have often come into play. So stay close to all three parties, not just for the next 15 months, 
but beyond. The second thing is that Parliament will matter more, just as Parliament has mattered more in, uh, this, um, in, in the last four years, three and a half, four years. Um, it used to be the case that once an election was over, once you had a clear single-party government with a comfortable majority, which has been the normal experience since the Second World War up until 2010, for the next certainly three or four years, all you've really needed to do, if there's a particular issue that has concerned you, you needed to get hold of the relevant civil servants, get hold of the relevant ministers, get hold of perhaps the relevant senior backbenchers in the governing party, if you can sort them out, you've done it. It's no longer like that um, because they're not the only players in determining the outcome. So you need to spread your net far wider um, when you're looking at those backbenchers who support the government, those who might rebel, uh, and so on. And the third lesson is that... I think individual MPs, it's not just blocks of loyalists or blocks of rebels that you need to get hold of, but I think individual MPs will matter more. Some of you may have heard this morning on the radio uh, the news story that the government is going to give a free vote to the issue of whether the health secretary should have the power to ban adults from smoking in cars when children are present. Um, I think we're moving into an era when there are going to be many more free votes. When you've got an issue which is not central to the government's uh, economic or, or ideological purpose, uh, why should they waste political capital trying to put through or block a measure which, on which MPs in all parties might have different views? So I think we're going to see many more free votes and therefore many more cases where it isn't just about getting hold of rebel leaders of a certain bloc inside the Conservative or Labour or Liberal Democrat parties, but a lot of individual MPs. So I think the political relationship between the Advertising Association or any other part of our commercial life, so it includes your clients as well as yourselves, operating in the new politics is going to be much more varied, um, much more subtle, um, um, much more time consuming, much more varied than it's been up to now. Now, I've been around too long to stand between a thirsty audience and a coffee break, so I'm just going to finish off, if I may, with a brief YouGov commercial, because we've been um, developing over the last um, few months um, a new device, some of you may, may know about this, because we are an internet-based company with our own 400,000 strong panel, we cumulatively get to know a huge amount about our panel members, what they're like, their lifestyles, their consumer choices, and so on, um, and how uh, different companies, uh, brands, go up and down daily. We can now, in a way that has never been possible before, provide much more detailed information about how advertising campaigns work, not just whether they're getting through to people, but whether you're reaching the right people with the right intensity, um, and do this more or less in, in real time. So if your advertising is working, we will, we'll be able to tell you to prove it, and you can go on to greater things. If it's not working, we'll be able to tell your competitors. I hope you think, on balance, this is an advantage. Um, end of advertisement. Uh, we'll be following up politics up to the next election and beyond. But as I say, think hard, think broad, think in detail and think subtly because all the parties and a great many more MPs than ever before are going to matter, not just for the next 15 months, but beyond. Thank you.